James Abbott McNeil Whistler. He was born in 1834 and died in 1903. And he was, quite frankly, full of himself. But he was also an extraordinary artist. Whistler, born an American, identified himself as a Londoner. Art making in Europe was in the throes of a massive upheaval. Stodgy allegorical paintings of mythology, pompous larger-than-life portraits of nobility, and grandiose epic landscapes of locations that could only exist in Star Wars movies were threatened by a new group of artists once derisively dismissed as impressionists. They painted everyday life as they saw it and felt it. Whistler embraced it. However, author, pontificator, art critic, and soon-to-be libelous John Ruskin was aghast at Whistler's painting in the style of Ruskin's idol, Turner. Turner painted with noble morality and meaning, whereas Whistler simply painted life before him. Ruskin fumed at seeing a billowing, belching, and polluting industrial factory painted in a style reminiscent of Turner. The audacity of painting the mundane was too much for him. Ruskin lashed out at Whistler, accusing him of flinging a pot of paint in the public's face. That smack talk led to Whistler suing Ruskin for libel, a case that Whistler won. Sadly, Whistler could not leave it at that. He seethed for years at the slight. Unfortunately for Whistler, he would tragically develop a pattern of not being able to let go of perceived slights. Close friendships would be shattered by his outsized ego and inability to forgive and let go. Both the careers and reputations of Ruskin and Whistler would continue to falter until their deaths. But once again... I'm ahead of myself, so let me back up and give a little bit of a, of a backgrounder here. Sometime back, I interviewed an artist by the name of John Lasseter. That was in episode number 33 of the Artful Painter podcast. He had written a blog post that drew attention to Whistler's famous lecture, 10 o'clock. Whistler gave that lecture back in 1885. So I was intrigued and went back and did a little digging, and I decided I wanted to purchase a early edition of the transcript to Whistler's 10 O'Clock. And I found one. I found a copy that was published in 1917. Now, that's not one of the earlier editions, but it's, it's, fairly, it's a fairly old edition. I mean, even that book is well over 100 years old. But what really intrigued me about this book is uh, there were the they were handmade. There was handmade paper. Uh, the book still retains the deckle edge of the handmade paper, so it's a pretty cool edition. And they were they were usually published in just an edition of say like three hundred, four hundred uh, copies at a time. So I bought a copy of the book, and intrigued, I read Whistler's lecture in just one sitting. But I have to admit, I did not at first understand it. This appeal of art for art's sake went way over my head on first reading. Now, part of the problem is it's one of context. Uh, keep in mind, it has been 136, 137 plus years, depending on when you're listening to this, since this lecture was given. Cultural references, celebrities, Memes of the day uh, that are mentioned in his lecture would be lost to a modern audience, in particular, me. So I had to do a little digging just to grasp what he was talking about. As I read Whistler's lecture, I wondered what it must have been like to be seated in the packed Prince Hall Auditorium waiting to hear from Mr. Art himself, James Abbott McNeil Whistler. One account describes assembling together for Whistler's lecture this way. When the eventful evening arrived, there was not a seat to be had for love or money. All the smart people were there. Now, it must have been an electric experience. Even on a cold February night in London, I imagine as the crowds gathered into the main auditorium there, the air warmed up. 
and it was perhaps filled with the smoke of cigarettes and cigars and pipes, because back then, you know, people smoked openly. Without modern sound reinforcement equipment, it may have been difficult for those towards the back to hear. I don't know. Maybe the, the acoustics was good, uh, but that's something. Uh, there's no recordings of this, this lecture, so it's really hard to imagine what it was like. But with that vision in mind, I decided I just had to do a reenactment of the lecture. Frankly, uh, a reenactment is fraught with challenges. Whistler died in 1903, and there are no, as far as I could discern, audio recordings of his voice. I doubt seriously that my own southern dialect is anywhere close to Whistler's voice. He was from Massachusetts and spent much of his career in Europe, London in particular. I imagine his voice was in part affected by that influence. One anonymous review described Whistler's tone during his 10 o'clock lecture this way, and I quote, Having appealed to the vision, speaking of his attire, rooming, and poise, he proceeded to appeal to society's sense of hearing, and exaggerating his American twang, invented a species of Yankee dialect, here thereto unknown. Hmm. That reminds me of the affected and made-up dialects that were used in early Hollywood movies by stars such as Gary Cooper and Katherine Hepburn. The first-hand account of listening to Whistler's lecture that evening continues. In this, he made it his business to utter grotesque antithetical incoherences and to ramble on in a maundering monotone from theme to theme. Now, I don't know about you, I, I can't even picture that in my mind. Just what on earth was Whistler doing with his delivery? I don't know. So, not knowing any of that, I mean, I just don't know how to interpret that. I decided my approach in this reenactment would be to just be myself. I'm no method actor. I'm, I'm nothing like Whistler in personality. I'm no orator. So this performance would be done like an impressionist painting. It would have some essence of the event and a lot of interpretation. And then there's the matter of the length of the lecture. Most resources say that the lecture was about an hour long. I, I don't know about that. Uh, I rehearsed this, this presentation several times, and rarely was I able to slow it down enough to get it to beyond, you know, 30, 40 minutes. 40 minutes is about as long as I could do it without really dragging it on. So clearly, I'm missing something. Not having heard Whistler's presentation, there's just no way I can duplicate it. Uh, the actual recording that you're about to listen to is about 38 minutes long, maybe 40 minutes long. And it includes some embellishments with a musical interlude at the beginning and the end of, of the lecture. But again, that's just an interpretation. I don't really know what actually happened at the lecture. So just another comment about my interpretation of the lecture, my performance of it. I chose to take the approach that Whistler was not announced. I don't think anywhere in the literature does it say that an MC or a chairman of a meeting actually announced Whistler. What I picture, what I envision is Whistler as simply walking onto the stage with no introduction. And as he takes his position, and after a long pregnant pause, he simply begins speaking. In Don C. Uh, Stites Ford, in my edition of 10 o'clock, he describes Whistler's taking the stage this way. He said, the small figure in black, looking much like his portrait of Sarasate, grew into transcendent size. The threadony expanded into a sonorous song, exalting art, magnificent, immortal. It reads today like a mighty chant, fit to be sung by a great chorus. <laughs> well, I guess all I can conclude there is uh, Seats was clearly a fan of Whistler. <laughs> I, I don't know, but that's as an interesting take on it. 
Now, before I get into the actual presentation here in just a few moments, uh, just like to share some thoughts from Suzanne Cooper. Uh, she described Whistler's arrival on stage this way, and I quote, a man in immaculate evening dress stepped onto the stage in Prince Hall, Piccadilly. He placed a glossy opera hat on the table, set down his walking cane, and adjusted his eyeglass. James Whistler appeared in the footlights like a figure from one of his own canvases and arrangement in black and silver. And Suzanne Cooper goes on to comment about his actual delivery, at least as far as she could ascertain from the notes that she had. She says that Whistler evidently faltered a little as he cast his eye over the upturned faces before him. So basically, uh, he must have had a bit of stage fright. Uh, you think about as he looks out in the audience, uh, one of the people that he makes a good deal of fun of is Oscar Wilde, the, the Irish poet Oscar Wilde. And so there he is sitting in the audience. Whistler could not have missed him. But, you know, uh, despite the, the jabs that Whistler made of Oscar Wilde, uh, Wilde took it in, in uh, stride. He did a really cheeky write-up of his experience attending the lecture, and he describes Whistler as he pontificated from the stage this way, and I quote, The scene was in every way delightful. He stood there, a miniature Mephistopheles, mocking the majority. He was like a brilliant surgeon, lecturing to a class composed of subjects destined ultimately for dissection and solemnly assuring them how valuable to science their maladies were, and how absolutely uninteresting the slightest symptoms of health on their part would be. In fairness to the audience, however, I must say that they seemed extremely gratified at being rid of the dreadful responsibility of admiring anything, and nothing could have exceeded their enthusiasm when they were told by Mr. Whistler that no matter how vulgar their dresses were or how hideous their surroundings at home, still it was possible that a great painter, if there was such a thing, could, by contemplating them in the twilight and half closing his eyes, see them under really picturesque conditions and produce a picture which they were not to attempt to understand, much less dare to enjoy. Wilde concludes, he says, Mr. Whistler's lecture last night was, like everything that he does, a masterpiece. Not merely for its clever satire and amusing jest will it be remembered, but for the pure and perfect beauty of many of its passages, passages delivered with an earnestness, and those who had looked on Mr. Whistler as a master of persiflage Merely, and had not known him as we do, as a master of painting also. For that he is indeed one of the very greatest masters of painting, is my opinion. And I may add that in this opinion, Mr. Whistler himself entirely concurs. <laughs> yeah, wow. Go Oscar Wilde. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, as I said at the outset, Mr. Whistler sadly was rather full of himself, and his friendship with Oscar Wilde would, in fact, uh, deteriorate shortly after that. It's, uh, it's, really, it's really unfortunate. So it's fitting that my delivery cracks a bit and wavers at the beginning with Mr. Whistler's bout of stage fright and the wavering of my voice. Hopefully some of Whistler's earnestness and satire comes through. The listener will simply have to accept my mispronunciation of certain words, <laughs> no, many words, names, and phrases, as my version of Whistler's grotesque antithetical incoherences. Well, anyway, I hope you enjoy my interpretation of James Abbott McNeil Whistler's 10 o'clock lecture, nonetheless.
Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great hesitation and much misgiving that I appear before you in the character of the preacher. If timidity be at all allied to the virtue modesty and can find favor in your eyes, I pray you for the sake of that virtue, accord me your utmost indulgence. I would plead for my want of habit did it not seem preposterous, judging from precedent, that aught save the most efficient effrontery could be ever expected in connection with my subject. For I will not conceal from you that I mean to talk about art, yes, art, that has of late become, as far as much discussion and writing can make it, a sort of common topic for the tea table. Art is upon the town, to be chucked under the chin by the passing gallant, to be enticed within the gates of the householder, to be coaxed into company as a proof of culture and refinement. If familiarity can breed contempt, certainly art, or what it is currently taken for, has been brought to its lowest stage of intimacy. The people have been harassed with art in every guise and vexed with many methods as to its endurance. They have been told how they shall love art and live with it. Their homes have been invaded, their walls covered with paper, their very dress taken to task until roused at last, bewildered and filled with doubts and discomforts of senseless suggestion. They resent such intrusion and cast forth the false prophets who have brought the very name of the beautiful into disrepute and derision upon themselves. Alas, ladies and gentlemen, art has been maligned. She has naught in common with such practices. She is a goddess of dainty thought, reticent of habit, abjuring all obtrusiveness, purposing in no way to better others. She is withal selfishly occupied with her own perfection only, having no desire to teach, seeking and finding the beautiful in all conditions and in all times, as did her high priest Rembrandt, when he saw picturesque grandeur and noble dignity in the Jews' quarter of Amsterdam and lamented not that its inhabitants were not Greeks, as did Tenoret and Paul Veronese among the Venetians, while not halting to change the brocaded silks for the classic draperies of Athens, as did at the court of Philip Velasquez, whose infantus, clad in inesthetic hoops, are as works of art of the same quality as the elegant marbles. No reformers were these great men, no improvers of the ways of others. Their productions alone were their occupation, and filled with the poetry of their science, they required not to alter their surroundings, for, as the laws of their art were revealed to them, they saw in the development of their work that real beauty which, to them, was as much a matter of certainty and triumph as is to the astronomer the verification of the result foreseen with the light given to him alone. In all this, their world was completely severed from that of their fellow creatures with whom sentiment is mistaken for poetry and for whom there is no perfect work that shall not be explained by the benefit conferred upon themselves. Humanity takes the place of art, and God's creations are excused by their usefulness. Beauty is confounded with virtue, and, before a work of art, it is asked, what good shall it do? Hence, it is that nobility of action, in this life, is hopelessly linked with the merit of the work that portrays it. And thus, the people have acquired the habit of looking, as who should say, not at a picture, but through it, at some human fact that shall or shall not, from a social point of view, better their mental or moral state. So we have come to hear of the painting that elevates and of the duty of the painter, of the picture that is full of thought and of the panel that merely decorates. A favorite faith, dear to those who teach, is that certain periods were especially artistic and that nations readily named were notably lovers of art. 
So we are told that the Greeks were, as a people, worshipers of the beautiful, and that in the 15th century, art was ingrained in the multitude. That the great masters lived in common understanding with their patrons. That the early Italians were artists, all, and that the demand for the lovely thing produced it. That we of today, in gross contrast to this Arcadian purity, call for the ungainly and obtain the ugly. That could we but change our habits and climate, were we willing to wander in groves, could we be roasted out of broadcloth? Were we to do without haste and journey without speed, we should again acquire the spoon of Queen Anne and pick at our peas with the fork of two prongs. And so, for the flock, little hamlets grow near Hammersmith. Useless, quite hopeless and false is the effort, built upon fable, and all because a wise man has uttered a vain thing and filled his belly with the east wind. Listen, there never was an artistic period. There never was an art-loving nation. In the beginning, man went forth each day, some to do battle, some to the chase, others again to dig and to dwell in the field, all that they might gain and live or lose and die. Until there was found among them one, differing from the rest, whose pursuits attracted him not, and so he stayed by the tents with the women and traced strange devices with a burnt stick upon a gourd. This man who took no joy in the ways of his brethren, who cared not for conquest and fretted in the field, this designer of quaint patterns, this deviser of the beautiful, who perceived in nature about him curious curvings as faces are seen in the fire, this dreamer apart was the first artist. And when, from the field and from afar, there came back the people, they took the gourd and drank from out of it. And presently there came to this man another, and in time others of like nature, chosen by the gods. And so they worked together, and soon they fashioned from the moistened earth forms resembling the gourd. And with the power of creation, the heirloom of the artist, presently they went beyond the slovenly suggestion of nature, and the first vase was born in beautiful proportion. And the toilers tilled and were athirst, and the heroes returned from fresh victories to rejoice and to feast, and all drank alike from the artist's goblets, fashioned cunningly, taking no note the while of the craftsman's pride, and understanding not his glory in his work, drinking at the cup, not from choice, not from a consciousness that it was beautiful, but because, forsooth, there was none other. And time, with more state, brought more capacity for luxury. And it became well that men should dwell in large houses and rest upon couches and eat at tables. Whereupon the artist, with his artificers, built palaces and filled them with furniture, beautiful in proportion and lovely to look upon. And the people lived in marvels of art and ate and drank out of masterpieces. Well, there was nothing else to eat and to drink out of and no bad building to live in, no article of daily life, of luxury or of necessity that had not been handed down from the design of the master and made by his workmen. And the people questioned not and had nothing to say in the matter. So Greece was in its splendor and art reigned supreme by force of fact, not by election. And there was no meddling from the outsider. The mighty warrior would no more have ventured to offer a design for the temple of Pallas Athene then would the sacred poet have proffered a plan for constructing the catapults. And the amateur was unknown, and the dilettante undreamed of. And history rode on, and conquest accompanied civilization, and art spread, or rather its products were carried by the victors among the vanquished from one country to another. And the customs of cultivation covered the face of the earth, so that all peoples continued to use what the artist alone produced." And centuries passed in this using, and the world was flooded with all that was beautiful, until there arose a new class, who discovered the cheap, and foresaw fortune in the facture of the sham. 
then sprang into existence the tawdry, the common, the gewgaw. The taste of the tradesmen supplanted the science of the artist, and what was born of the million went back to them and charmed them, for it was after their own heart. And the great and the small, the statesman and the slave, took to themselves the abomination that was tendered and preferred it and have lived with it ever since. And the artist's occupation was gone, and the manufacturer and the huckster took his place. And now the heroes filled from the jugs and drank from the bowls with understanding, noting the glare of their new bravery and taking pride in its worth. And the people, this time, had much to say in the matter, and all were satisfied. And Birmingham and Manchester arose in their might, and art was relegated to the curiosity shop. Nature contains the elements in color and form of all pictures, as the keyboard contains the notes of all music. But the artist is born to pick and choose and group with science these elements, that the result may be beautiful, as the musician gathers his notes and forms his chords until he brings forth from chaos glorious harmony. To say to the painter that nature is to be taken as she is, is to say to the player that he may sit on the piano. <laughs> that nature is always right is an assertion artistically, as untrue as it is one whose truth is universally taken for granted. Nature is rarely right, to such an extent even that it might almost be said that nature is usually wrong. That is to say, the condition of things that shall bring about the perfection of harmony worthy of a picture is rare and not common at all. This would seem to even the most intelligent a doctrine almost blasphemous. So incomported with our education was the supposed aphorism become that its belief is held to be part of our moral being and the words themselves have in our ear the ring of religion. Still, seldom does nature succeed in producing a picture. The sun blares, the wind blows from the east, the sky is bereft of cloud, and without, all is of iron. The windows of the Crystal Palace are seen from all points of London. The holiday maker rejoices in the glorious day, and the painter turns aside to shut his eyes. How little this is understood, and how dutifully the casual in nature is accepted as sublime, may be gathered from the unlimited admiration daily produced by a very foolish sunset. <laughs> the dignity of the snow-capped mountain is lost in distinctness, but the joy of the tourist is to recognize the traveler on the top. The desire to see for the sake of seeing is, with the mass alone, the one to be gratified, hence the delight in detail. And when the evening mist clothes the riverside with poetry, as with a veil, and the poor buildings lose themselves in the dim sky, and the tall chimneys become campanile, and the warehouses are palaces in the night, and the whole city hangs in the heavens, and fairyland is before us, then the wayfarer hastens home, the working man and the cultured one, the wise man and the one of pleasure, cease to understand as they have ceased to see, and nature, who for once has sung in tune, sings her exquisite song to the artist alone, her son and her master, her son in that he loves her, her master in that he knows her. To him her secrets are unfolded, to him her lessons have become gradually clear. He looks at her flower, not with the enlarging lens that he may gather facts for the botanist, but with the light of the one who sees in her choice selection of brilliant tones and delicate tints, suggestions of future harmonies. He does not confine himself to purposeless copying. Without thought, each blade of grass as commended by the inconsequent, but in the long curve of the narrow leaf, corrected by the straight tall stem, he learns how grace is wedded to dignity how strength enhances sweetness, that elegance shall be the result. In the citron wing of the pale butterfly, with its dainty spots of orange, he sees before him the stately halls of fair gold, with their slender saffron pillars, and is taught how the delicate drawing high upon the walls 
shall be traced in tender tones of orpiment and repeated by the bass in notes of graver hue. In all that is dainty and lovable, he finds hints for his own combinations, and thus is nature ever his resource, and always at his service, and to him is naught refused. Through his brain as through the last alemic is distilled the refined essence of that thought which began with the gods and which they left him to carry out. Set apart by them to complete their works, he produces that wondrous thing called the masterpiece, which surpasses in perfection all that they have contrived in what is called nature. And the gods stand by and marvel and perceive how far away more beautiful is the Venus of Milos than was of their own Eve. For some time past, the unattached writer has become the middleman in this matter of art, and his influence why it has widened the gulf between the people and the painter has brought about the most complete misunderstanding as to the aim of the picture. For him, a picture is more or less a hieroglyph or symbol of story. Apart from a few technical terms, for the display of which he finds an occasion, the work is considered absolutely from a literary point of view. Indeed, from what other can he consider it? And in his essays, he deals with it as with a novel, a history, or an anecdote. He fails entirely and most naturally to see its excellences or demerits artistic and so degrades art by supposing it a method of bringing about a literary climax. It thus, in his hands, becomes merely a means of perpetrating something further and his mission is made a secondary one even as a means is second to an end. The thoughts emphasized, noble or other, are inevitably attached to the incident and become more or less noble according to the eloquence or mental quality of the writer who looks the while with disdain upon what he holds as mere execution, a matter belonging, he believes, to the training of the schools and the reward of assiduity. So that, as he goes on with his translation from canvas to paper, the work becomes his own. He finds poetry where he would feel it were he himself transcribing the event, invention in the intricacy of the mise scene, and noble philosophy in some detail of philanthropy, courage, modesty, or virtue suggested to him by the occurrence. All of this might be brought before him and his imagination be appealed to by a very poor picture. Indeed, I might safely say that it generally is. <laughs> Meanwhile, the painter's poetry is quite lost to him. The amazing invention that shall have put form and color into such perfect harmony, that exquisiteness is the result. He is without understanding the nobility of thought that shall have given the artist dignity to the whole says to him absolutely nothing. So that his praises are published for virtues we would blush to possess while the great qualities that distinguish the one work from the thousand that make of the masterpiece the thing of beauty that it is have never been seen at all. That this is so we can make sure of by looking back at old reviews upon past exhibitions and reading the flatteries lavished upon men who have since been forgotten altogether, but upon whose works the language has been exhausted in rhapsodies that left nothing for the National Gallery. A curious matter in its effect upon the judgment of these gentlemen is the accepted vocabulary of poetic symbolism that helps them by habit in dealing with nature. A mountain to them is synonymous with height a lake with depth, the ocean with vastness, the sun with glory. So that a picture with a mountain, a lake, and an ocean, however poor in paint, is inevitably lofty, vast, infinite, and glorious on paper. There are those also somber of mien and wise with wisdom of books who frequent museums and burrow in crypts, collecting, comparing, compiling, classifying, contradicting. Experts, these, for whom a date is an accomplishment, a hallmark, success. 
Careful in scrutiny are they, and conscientious of judgment, establishing with due weight unimportant reputations, discovering the picture, by the stain on the back testing the torso, by the leg that is missing, filling folios with doubts on the way of that limb, disputations and dictatorial, concerning the birthplace of inferior persons, speculating in much writing upon the great worth of bad work. True clerks of the collection, they mix memoranda with ambition, and reducing art to statistics, they file the 15th century and pigeonhole the antique. Then the preacher appointed. He stands in high places, harangues and holds forth, sage of the universities, learned in many matters, and of much experience in all, save his subject. Exhorting, denouncing, directing, filled with wrath and earnestness, bringing powers of persuasion and polish of language to prove nothing. Torn with much teaching, having naught to impart, impressive, important, shallow, defiant, distressed, desperate, crying out and cutting himself while the gods hear not. Gentle priest of the Philistine withal, again he ambles pleasantly from all point, and through many volumes, escaping scientific assertion, babbles of green fields. So art has become foolishly confounded with education, that all should be equally qualified. Whereas, while polish, refinement, culture, and breeding are in no way arguments for artistic result, it is also no reproach to the most finished scholar or greatest gentleman in the land that he be absolutely without eye for painting or ear for music, that in his heart he prefer the popular print to the scratch of Rembrandt's needle, or the songs of the hall to Beethoven's C minor symphony. Let him have the wit to say so, and not feel the admission a proof of inferiority. Art happens. No hovel is safe from it. No prince may depend upon it. The vastest intelligence cannot bring it about, and puny efforts to make it universal end in quaint comedy and coarse farce. This is as it should be, and all attempts to make it otherwise are due to the eloquence of the ignorant, the zeal of the conceited. The boundary line is clear. Far from me to propose to bridge it over, that the pestered people be pushed across. No, I would save them from further fatigue. I would come to their relief and would lift from their shoulders this incubus of arts. Why, after centuries of freedom from it and indifference to it, should it now be thrust upon them by the blind, until wearied and puzzled, they know no longer how they shall eat or drink, how they shall sit or stand, or wherewithal they shall clothe themselves without afflicting art. But lo, there is much talk without. Triumphantly they cry, Beware, this matter does indeed concern us. We also have our part in all true art. Or remember the one touch of nature that makes the whole world kin. True indeed, but let not the unwary jauntily suppose that Shakespeare herewith hands him his passport to paradise, and thus permits him speech among the chosen. Rather learn that in this very sentence he is condemned to remain without, to continue with the common. This one chord that vibrates with all, this one touch of nature that calls aloud to the response of each, that explains the popularity of the bull of Paul Potter. That excuses the price of Murillo's conception. This one unspoken sympathy that pervades humanity is vulgarity. <laughs> vulgarity, under whose fascinating influence the many have elbowed the few and the gentle circle of art swarms with the intoxicated mob of mediocrity whose leaders prate in council and call aloud where the gods once spoke in whisper. And now, far from their midst, the dilettante stalks abroad. The amateur is loose, the voice of the esthete is heard in the land, and catastrophe is upon us. The meddler beckons the vengeance of the gods, and the ridicule threatens the fair daughters of the land. And there are curious converts to a weird cult, in which all instinct for attractiveness, all freshness and sparkle, all woman's winsomeness, is to give way to a strange vocation for the unlovely and this desecration in the name of the graces. Shall this gaunt, ill at ease, distressed, abashed mixture of 
Move Hante and desperate assertion, call itself artistic and claim cousinship with the artist who delights in the dainty, the sharp, bright gaiety of beauty? No, a thousand times no. Here are no connections of ours. We will have nothing to do with them. Forced to seriousness, that emptiness may be hidden. They dare not smile. While the artist in fullness of heart and head is glad and laughs aloud and is happy in his strength and is merry at the pompous pretension, the solemn silliness that surrounds him. For art and joy go together with bold openness and high head and ready hand, fearing naught and dreading no exposure. Know then, all beautiful women, that we are with you. Pay no heed, we pray you, to this outcry of the unbecoming, this last plea for the plain. It concerns you not. Your own instinct is near the truth, your own wit far surer guide than the untaught ventures of thick-heeled Apollos. What, will you up and follow the first piper that leads you down Petticoat Lane there on a Sabbath, together for the week from the dull rags of ages, wherewith to bedeck yourselves? that beneath your travestied awkwardness we have trouble to find your own dainty selves? Oh, fie! Is the world then exhausted, and must we go back because the thumb of the mounty banks jerks the other way? Costume is not dress, and the wearers of wardrobes may not be doctors of taste. For by what authority shall these be pretty masters? Look well, and nothing they have invented, nothing put together for comeliness' sake. Haphazard from their shoulders hang the garments of the hawker, combining in their person the motley of many manners with the medley of the mummer's closet. Set up as a warning and a finger post of danger, they point to the disastrous effect of art upon the middle classes. Why this lifting of the brow and deprecation of the present, this pathos in reference to the past? If art be rare today, it was seldom heretofore. It is false, this teaching of decay. The master stands in no relation to the moment at which he occurs, a moment of isolation, hitting at sadness, having no part in the progress of his fellow men. He is also no more the product of civilization than is the scientific truth asserted, dependent upon the wisdom of a period. The assertion itself requires the man to make it. The truth was from the beginning. So art is limited to the infinite, and beginning there cannot progress." A silent indication of its wayward independence from all extraneous advance is in the absolutely unchanged condition and form of implement since the beginning of things. The painter has but the same pencil, the sculptor, the chisel of centuries. Colors are not more since the heavy hangings of night were first drawn aside and the loveliness of light revealed. Neither chemist nor engineer can offer new elements of the masterpiece. False again, the fabled link between the grandeur of art and the glories and virtues of the state, for art feeds upon nations and peoples may be wiped from the face of the earth, but art is. It is indeed high time that we cast aside the weary weight of responsibility and co-partnership and know that in no way do our virtues minister to its worth, in no way do our vices impede its triumph. How irksome, how hopeless, how superhuman the self-imposed task of the nation, how sublimely vain the belief that it shall live nobly or art perish. Let us reassure ourselves that our own option is our virtue, art we in no way affect. A whimsical goddess and a capricious, her strong sense of joy tolerates no dullness, and live we never so spotlessly, Still may she turn her back upon us, as from time immemorial has she done upon the Swiss and their mountains. What more worthy people, whose very alpine gap yawns with tradition and is stocked with noble story, and yet the perverse and scornful one will none of it, and the sons of patriots are left with the clock that turns the mill and the sudden cuckoo with difficulty restrained in its box. From this was tell a hero, for this Gessler die. Art, the cruel jade, cares not, and hardens her heart, and hies her off to the east, to find among the opium eaters of Nankin, a favorite with whom she lingers fondly, caressing his blue porcelain, and painting his coy maidens, and marking his plates with her six marks of choice, indifferent 
and her companionship with him to all save the virtue of his refinement. He it is who calls her, he who holds her. And again to the West, that her next lover may bring together the gallery at Madrid and show to the world how the master towers above all. And in their intimacy they revel, he and she in this knowledge, and he knows the happiness untasted by other mortal. She is proud of her comrade and promises that, in after years, others shall pass that way and understand. So in all time does this superb one cast about for the man worthy of her love, and art seeks the artist alone. Where he is, there she appears, and remains with him, loving and fruitful, turning never aside in moments of hope deferred, of insult, and of ribald misunderstanding. And when he dies, she sadly takes her flight, though loitering yet in the land, from fond association, but refusing to be consoled. With the man, then, and not with the multitude, are her intimacies. And in the book of her life, the names inscribed are few, scant, indeed, the list of those who have helped to write her story of love and beauty. From the sunny morning, when, with her glorious Greek relenting, she yielded up the secret of repeated line, as with his hand in hers, together they marked in marble the measured rhyme of lovely limb and draperies flowing in unison to the day when she dipped the Spaniard's brush in light and air and made his people live within their frames and stand upon their legs that all nobility and sweetness and tenderness and magnificence should be theirs by right. Ages had gone by and few had been her choice. Countless indeed the horde of pretenders but she knew them not. A teeming, seething, busy mass whose virtue was industry and whose industry was vice. Their names go to fill the catalog of the collection at home, of the gallery abroad, for the delectation of the bagman and the critic. Therefore we have cause to be merry and to cast away all care, resolved that all is well as it ever was and that it is not meet that we should be cried at and urged to take measures. Enough have we endured of dullness. Surely are we weary of weeping, and our tears have been cousin from us falsely, for they have called out woe when there was no grief, and alas, where all is fair. We have then but to wait, until with the mark of the gods upon him there come among us again the chosen, who shall continue what has gone before, satisfied that even were he never to appear, The story of the beautiful is already complete, hewn in the marbles of the Parthenon, embroidered with the birds upon the fan of Hakusai at the foot of Fujiyama. (laughs) 